June Wayne's power belies her five-foot stature. June is an artist in the truest sense of the word. Her intelligence, curiosity, and creativity, together with the passion that I referred to earlier, continues at age, is it, someone said you said you were 93, not 92. I'm going to be. Going to be. She, she, instead of going backwards, she's anticipating. So she's 92 now. Anyway, at 92, that passion continues to propel her forward. The synthesis of all these qualities results in what we call vision. And her vision for saving lithography led her to dedicate 10 years of her life to promoting this art form that was in danger of extinction when she founded Tamarind in 1960. Since handing over Tamarind um, to UNM, in 1970, June has continued to make art and waves, actively painting and making lithographs, and vociferously defending the causes that she believes in. And because June has played such a special role in, in our history, we have a very special gift today for her because we are crowning her queen oh. of lithography. Oh. 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 May I put it oh. on here? It'll be too big. <laughs> she thinks it'll be too big, but her head she is plenty me. big enough. <laughs> I also have to say that Lynn Allen, who was known during her time at Tamarind for making birthday hats, made this crown for June. So Lynn Allen did. Oh. Lynn's here somewhere. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? So thank you. That's so beautiful. <laughs> so beautiful. I well. wish I had a round head. <laughs> so never known for mincing words, June speaks for herself much better than anyone else does. So get ready for June Wayne to tell it like it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Is my hair messed up? Thank you. I can use every bit of praise I can get. Does this thing work? No, okay. It's only this one. Okay. I like to know that. Is this okay, Kip? Is it off? It's on? Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. All right. Yes, once your workspace is arranged and nothing's in your way, go for it. Um, it's really a tough thing to sit through this. I had no idea. There's a difference in sound level. Why is that? Huh? Bring it up? Will that be better? Okay. 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 That's, that's better. I can even hear it. Um, uh, it's uh, very um, discombobulating to be here and to see so many people in so many countries as a result of the coming together of that small team of people in Los Angeles 50 years ago. Um, I'm afraid of not doing it justice because the experience that I'm having is not easy to translate into words. But I think that maybe I should tell you a little bit, or a lot. If I speak faster, I can tell you more. Uh, incidentally, did you know that in order to be a reporter on television now, you have to be able to speak at twice the speed of normal speech. I just thought I'd toss it in so you'd no notice that. 
We're not getting more, but we're getting in a shorter piece of space, which in a way is happening to us as artists, as people, as part of the future. Um, Tavern actually happened through a series of accidents. I was interested in going to Paris because there was a printer there who had printed a certain lithograph that was lying very intimately in the same cylinder box as one of mine at the Museum of Modern Art. I saw such washes that I had never seen before. And I wanted to do, I was going to do a, an artist's book on the poetry of John Donne, which was very much against the times, you have to understand, that anything literary at the time of the uh, New York School and the Abstract Expressionists was, was, and several people said to me, June, you'll ruin your career if you do a book on uh, prints about poetry. But I was a woman. This has gone dead again, has it? It's well, I could go to the podium, I suppose. Um, I just refuse to talk if you can't hear me. <laughs> You've got another yeah. one right here for me. Will that work? Okay. Good. Good. Why waste the time, right? Anyway, I wanted to do these poems of John Donne, and I wanted to be able to use wash techniques, and I wanted them to be quite brilliant, and there was nobody in the United States that I knew of who could print them. And when I saw that print by Mario Avati called La Metropolitaine, I said, whoever printed that is the guy I'm going to work with. And I went to Paris and dug out Avati, who very graciously took me to his printer, Marcel Durassier. And then I did the work of the Leave d'artiste with Marcel, and I learned French with a Basque accent. <laughs> and for two months, although I was saying all the right things, nobody understood me. And I had to find a phoneticist in Paris to come to my room and teach me how to speak French the way the uh, Parisians spoke it. One of just many handicaps at the time. Now, before I left for Paris, the day be, a day or two before, I received a letter from the Ford Foundation. And it was a letter which was very personally addressed with a full stamp, but I could tell it was a routine letter. And it said, dear so-and-so, will you please tell us what do you think of the Ford Foundation's program in the humanities and the arts? And all they were doing at the time was giving $10,000 grants to artists. And I looked at this thing. I was leaving the next day. And, oh, I said, to hell with it, I'll answer. So I wrote a rather snotty letter <laughs> saying, because I was in a hurry. And I said, I think it's lovely that you're giving $10,000 grants to artists. But in six months, the money will be spent. The artists will be just as broke as ever. And what's more, they will made, have made a lot of enemies of all the artists who thought they should have got the 10,000. Uh, why don't you do something that changes the ecology a bit? And I sent off this letter, and then I flew off to New York. And in New York, forwarded from California, there was a phone call from a man named William Wilson, 
McNeil Lowry. I didn't know who he was, but he was Ford Foundation. And he said, I'd like to talk to you. And he said, can you come in tomorrow? I said, no, I'm going, I'm going to be on the boat at 11 o'clock. I said, but I'd come at 8 in the morning if you have breakfast for me. <laughs> so he said, fine. And I went. And that was before Ford had that magnificent building with the trees growing inside the atrium. And there I met this man. The offices were unimpressive. I don't think he had a corner office. I don't know. Or if he had, I, it's, it escaped my uh, memory. And there was this man who looked very much like a Presbyterian minister. He was dressed in black. He had a black knit tie, white shirt, almost no hair. But what hair there was was sort of golden. It's, he had pale blue eyes that kind of twinkled. I mean, he was not a frightening fellow. But on the other hand, I didn't think he would use any four-letter words. <laughs> and we began talking. And we had a rapid-fire conversation that went for about two hours. And he, why are you going to Paris? And I said, well, there, I was talking about the condition of artists, the problems that artists have, which was a su subject very familiar to me because I had been on the WPA easel project in the 30s in Chicago. And at that time, we organized an artist union, not knowing that you can't have a union unless you have an industry to bargain with. <laughs> um, and. Um, he said to me, why are you going to Paris? And I said, well, there's a case in point. I have to travel 6,000 miles to find a printer because I want to do this project. American artists do not have collaborators as the Europeans do. If Picasso wants to make a print or do ceramic or tapestry, what he He's got the artisans right there to work with him. No wonder we think he's protean. But at that time, if you recall, I'm talking about the 50s, the sculptors were using soldering irons and dripping bits of metal on top of each other to make metal sculpture. That's how, how isolated artists were from all the processes in which they might have been expressing themselves. So there's a case in point. The whole print field is without a, a, a fabric of collaborators who, with whom you can go and work. And if artists could make prints the way they're doing in Europe, we would have another source of income. But we would also be expressing ourselves in another medium, not just oil and paint, but. And that sort of interested Lowry, that idea of collaboration. I don't think many of you realize, perhaps you do, but in the 50s, the Print Council of America and its curators set the standards for what constituted an original print. And if you didn't print your print yourself, it was not an original. And these were the gatekeepers. You could not use presses of unusual kinds. I started using offset whenever I needed. I just didn't tell them. And there was a very rigid attitude toward what printmaking and print printers could do. I mean. Uh, uh, print collectors and printer, print, print makers could do. I talked about these things with Lowry and talked about the lack of collaboration as an acceptable way for artists to work and to expand. 
And he said, why are you going? What, what are you doing now? And I told him I was going to do this suite by John Donne in Paris and in Berlin. And uh, he said, well, will, will you let me see the book when you come back? And I said, sure. And off I went. And as I walked out, it turned out that Mac McDaniel was there. The Ford Foundation had once, part of it had been in Pasadena. We called it itching palms at that time. Um, and uh, Mac McDaniel had been in California. And he said, June, how'd you get in there? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you have been talking to the horse's mouth. And this guy didn't look like the horse's mouth to me. But anyway, off I went. Got on the ship, went, did the book, had a lot of adventures, including crossing the red zone without a visa, things like that. It was really difficult to do what you wanted to. But Avati took me to his printer. And in 70 days and 70 nights, we did an edition of 110 books of 15 lithos each. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of that, but I'm going to tell you that when I got back to the States, I was staying at the New Yorker Hotel, and uh, I remembered this fellow. And so I got a penny postcard and said, I'm back in town. If you want to see the book, I'll be here two more days. And he called, and I took the book over. And there is this minister, this Presbyterian minister, looked at me, and he liked the book. But what really impressed him was that I said I was going to do it, and I actually did it. Because as foundation people know, a lot of people come in with ideas, but don't expect to have to actually do it. So I gained a certain um, credibility that I didn't know I was gaining. And we went on talking about the problems of lithography. And before I left him that day, Lowry said to me, would you write something down? Write, write down something. How would you go about this thing if you wanted to do something about lithography? Write it down. And I said, well, I'll think about it. And because I had plenty of troubles at home. I, my husband at the time was divorcing me. My mother was dying. And uh, there were other small issues on my plate. But nonetheless, that question, what would you do about it, became very interesting to me. And I began researching. How would you go? What would it look like? What kind of people would you need? And I talked to my friends who were lithographers. I knew Clinton Adams at the time. I talked with him, Jules Heller. There were some others. And I began writing The Plan of Tamron. It took about six months to do. At the time, I expected to bring my French printer over and then realized it was impossible because Mulo began bidding against us. And I hunted all over Europe for a master printer until I fell upon a news, uh, an article in an art magazine written by Garo and Trisian. And he sounded like he knew what he was talking about and that we were on kind of the same we uh, wavelength. So I got in touch with Garo and I went to Indianapolis. I tell you, the sacrifices I made. <laughs> I went all the way to Indianapolis to meet Garo, and we talked together and we worked together for about five days. And then I had to convince Lowry to accept a master printer from Indianapolis, not Paris. And that took quite a lot of doing. In any case, the day arrived when I sent off the plan for Tamron, and it included not only six clear goals, but the means and the budgets. And that plan was like the 
uh, framework of a steel skyscraper. It really worked, and it is still a template for how an art organization could, if it wished to, restore itself. That's how good that plan was. I sent it to Lowry, and he called me and said it appeared adequate. <laughs> and then a few weeks later, he called me, and he said, June, I have now circulated your plan to 100 people in the art world. I was furious because I had said to him, I will I only talk with you, no committees, no nothing. You betrayed me, I said. Those people will think I want something from you. I really don't want something from you. He said, Well, don't you want to know how it came out? He said, I have never submitted a plan more universally disapproved of by the art world. 95 out of 100 people excoriated it. And I said, well, what did you expect? Ask, if, ask a lot of damn fools, you're going to get damn fool answers. What do they know about it? He said, well, wait a minute. You did pick up a few champions. Don't you want to know who they are? Five out of 95. And one was James. I, it was many years before I found out who they were. One was Lincoln Kirstein. Another was James Johnson Sweeney. Another was Gustav von Groschwitz. A fourth was Ibra Feinblatt. And a, I don't think they asked Clinton or Garo, maybe thinking that you were already too committed. I don't know. I don't remember. And there was one other person I'm not sure of. And besides, said Lowry, I think you're right. And I am going to propose this. And it was MacNeil Lowry who pushed this through. It was MacNeil Lowry who understood what Tamarin was about. And it is MacNeil Lowry whose name has vanished from the books, from the history of all this that's happened. And it was he, his faith, his skill. He had an extraordinary social skill. And I think that you should know that W. McNeil Lowry did more for the arts of the United States than ever the Medici did for the Florentine state. <laughs> I'm not kidding. He decentralized the arts. He backed theater all over the country, ballet all over the country. He was behind the creation of, of um, um, there's a special word for money that you keep getting interest out of. I've forgotten the word. Endowments for symphony orchestras, for example. Wherever the arts lived, wherever artists were, and I mean the creative individuals, I don't mean just the honchos, I mean the cre creative individuals. He was a defender, a lover, a, a parent of, and he used everything he knew to assure to do what he could at his particular moment in time to support of the arts. And I bring forward his name because, in a sense, I was sort of an intercurrent molecule. I was on my way somewhere else, and he saw in me something that I was not seeing in myself except the rough and tumble of having been an artist for quite a time, because by that time I was in my 40s. He was also a philanthropist who backed women as well as men.
in a time that was so sexist that sometimes during the first 10 years of Cameron, I thought I would strangle on it. When often I would have to get some dumb guy to carry, to go see somebody because it was useless for me to go as a woman. That, remember that in the first 10 years of Tamron, we did not create one woman printer, even though I tried. The women had to redefine themselves in a way, and it was the feminist movement that helped to provide provided a certain buoyancy so that women began coming in to this medium. And as you all know, some of the best printers in this country are women now. I, I, do I hear a voice from the cheaper seats? <laughs> okay. I pause to mention that because, in a way, my role at Tamarind has been quite equivocal. People figure I had to be a really tough cookie. I must be one of those, excuse me, ball breakers, or at least a castrating female, to do what I did. And I had to put up with an awful lot of sexism. Remember that all the printers were guys. Most of the artists were guys. Some women came. And the women had problems with the guys a lot of times. Uh, sexism was running. Racism was the norm at the time. We had apartments for the printers. And when the landlord heard that we were going to have a black printer, he had a fit, and so did all the tenants. But somehow, we managed with the use of city intervention and laws and all the rest of it, so that when John Dowell arrived at Tamarind, he didn't know there had been a problem. And he took his apartment just the way everybody else did. But these were ancillary battles of one kind or another, some very small, some very big, that had to be dealt with. Now, Clinton Garrow came for the opening of Cameron. They were there for the first year, and then went back to their jobs. I ran Tamron for the rest of that time. That seems to have been forgotten. And I'm taking this occasion to remind you that I'm not feeling so goddamn modest at this moment. <laughs> I also want to tell you that although they thought I was feisty and maybe a little shocking, that the name for me among the guys, and of course the curators were women mostly, so there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on between the, the curators and the printers. If a curator found a print that had a streak in it or something, the guys felt that they were doing it deliberately to get back at them. Um, the, all of that played itself out in sotto voce at Tamarind, and we managed to survive it. But my name among them, not to my face, was the Feinschmecker. Does anyone know what that means? Isn't that sort of, I'm not, I was never sure what that meant, except I, I thought of it as somehow somebody who is a wine taster, you know, someone who, huh? Somebody who likes fine food. Yes, yes, the Feinschmecker. When I went by, they would say that, as if I didn't know. <laughs> anyway. The impact of Tamarind was one of instant revulsion around the country. New York was furious. How could Lowry, how could the Ford Foundation invest in a woman 
and an artist in La La Land. I mean, the combination of the three uh, was just so awful. And most of the print curators would not join our board. It wasn't until five years later when it was clear that we were there to stay and doing very well that then they flooded in and joined us, Johnny come lately. There's nothing succeeds like success. And Tamron was off and rolling. What you have seen in these workshops, every one of them could have been Tamron. It looked like that. You could see forever, all across the room, the relation of the artist to the printers had the same genial respect that you saw in all these workshops abroad. Because collaboration is, in my view, a very civilized act. Two people who may hate each other personally, who work together well, have, in a way, unknotted a piece of the terror of these times. Tamron and its closeness to touch, to smell, to feel, the feel of the paper, the sound of the ink. You know there's a certain sound when you slap the roller down, and another when the roller is fully charged. You can hear all that. You can taste it. That physicality of the art invades us all. And when a printer lifts that, she, there's a sound to that too, by the way. I'm very aware of the sounds of things. It's such a remarkable thing, and it talks to you. And then you add another one, and then you add another one. And you're all thinking about the same thing. It's a very civilized event. I view Tamarin as a model. I mean, that relationship in collaboration is a model for what we need so badly all over the world and which I see and heard from all of the guys and, and the uh, woman who spoke. I was sitting there and I couldn't hear too well. Or maybe it's me. I've got a lot of mileage on my ears. Anyway, the thing that I'm saying about the past as a civilized event, where in spite of what you think, I was able to say that civility and success in a work of art is a matter of 10 inches. It's the distance from your belly button to the press. <laughs> you think that's funny? It's real. It's really real. If you can get two people Thinking that way, you have the beginning of a society. So, all of these things about Litho, where are we now? What are you doing? Many of the, the presentations, or some of the presentations I heard today, were like Tamron at earlier stages. But you're not facing the same world that we were facing at that earlier stage. We are now in a time where you are the exception, where in many parts of the world, including our country, we have given up the idea that education is for everybody. Somehow we've misplaced that. When I was a kid, if you weren't enrolled in school by the time you were five and a half, they came out to find you. Can you imagine that happening today? We assume now, 
and it's a terrible assumption, that most of our young people will not have, even if they go to school, will not have the kind of education that we were getting 20 years ago. Have we given all that up by default? There are many other things of that kind that are almost gone now. And I worry about the future for all of us. I worry about the estates that we artists are leaving. We badly need a national art bank to take over artists' estates and, and help those, of, you know, when we kick off what happens to our families. Many of them are ruined by the estate taxes on work they never sold. There are many, many, many jobs that need to be done if you stop to think about the survival of all the arts in the ecology, in, in a hostile ecology. But I believe that these litho shops, this intimate collaboration, is uniquely capable of surviving many of the disasters that are attending bigger organizations. And I would hope that somewhere, perhaps on this campus, you have all the experts on the campus that you need. We need to do an, a forward-looking a forward map of the years just to come mapping the arts, all the arts together, as a single ecology, because we are too small a, con a constituency to survive as the separate arts. And we all have very, very similar problems. I would like to see such a think tank created. Uh, and there are a lot of other jobs I can think of, but I'm not blaming the on Marge because what she has done and is doing is remarkable. And I'm so grateful to see it. And I know that all of you are a part of that. But I urge you to look ahead because there are very significant social changes going on that we had better inform ourselves about. And on that rather bleak note, but actually a hopeful note in the sense that I think we can do something about our condition. We just cannot afford to sleep through it, to go through it like sleepwalkers. What's going on in the country now is something that needs the civility and the practicality that w all of us in this room have accepted as a way of life. We know how to do that. And I hope that something like that can happen as a result of Tamron's 50th. Maybe on the 60th, we'll have that kind of a think tank, and we'll have Tamron's going in the other arts as well. And I'll, I'll provide you a long list of tasks that need doing, just in case you can't imagine what they are. I love you all. I'm so grateful to be here to meet you and to thank you for your picking up to live your lives with the joy of smelling a beautiful piece of paper with a fresh coat of ink that's glistening as it comes off the press. Thank you.